Hello, and welcome to the Filmography Club podcast. I'm Jason Cavanis. Every season, we'll be looking at the work of one particular filmmaker, and we'll be looking at their filmography in chronological order, movie by movie, episode by episode. This season's filmmaker, Paul Thomas Anderson. But before we get into that, a little about this podcast. I'm a film enthusiast, not a cinephile. I have a passion for movies, both as a means of escapist entertainment and as an art form, but my appreciation for film as an art form is relatively new. Only in the last five or six years have I taken an interest in what makes a good movie, what makes a scene work. Before that, I only knew that I liked or didn't like a movie, but I really couldn't tell you why. Simply put, I'm a layman with a lot of curiosity. My hope is that this podcast will serve to inform and entertain you, the audience, yes, but More selfishly, I hope to use it as an excuse to get into conversations with smarter, more knowledgeable people than myself so that I can learn more about this wonderful art form. What I lack in expertise, I will do my best to make up for in enthusiasm and curiosity. And if I'm going to satisfy that curiosity, then I need guests that know their shit, and Will Fox is certainly that guy. I've known Will for many years. He's one of my oldest friends, and when we met as teens, he already had posters on his bedroom walls for movies that I still haven't seen. He's been working in media production and marketing for a long time, and he's one of my smartest, most insightful friends. I love talking movies with him. I talked him into being on the first three episodes of Filmography Club, since those first three PTA movies sort of make up the first phase of his career. I look forward to our conversations about Boogie Nights and Magnolia later this season, but for now, here's my conversation with Will on Paul Thomas Anderson's debut film, Heart Eight, also known as Sydney. If I were to give you $50, what would you do with it? I'd eat. How long can you eat? How long can you live on $50? I would bet not very long. You're definitely selling yourself short because you've always had extremely astute observations to make about music, film, pop culture, you know, anything. And so... The idea of you having conversations with folks about movies or filmmakers that you love is uh, definitely something that I look forward to listening to and am really honored to be a part of uh, of these first episodes. With it being PTA, I am curious. I mean, what is it about him that sort of locked in for you? I can speak to what kind of locked in for me, but... He's a, an emotional filmmaker. His films tend to have real weight to them. Uh, his stuff is, I don't really get misty-eyed at movies or TV very often, but uh, some of his stuff gets to me. You know, it's it's effective. Come on, give me an example of when you got teary-eyed watching a PTA movie. The very last scene in um, Magnolia, just the way Magnolia goes to credits, like gets me every fucking time when Melora Walters finally looks into the camera and you get like half a second of a smile after her being a coked out lunatic for the entire movie and just totally miserable for three hours, she finally smiles. And then it just the use of the music and the way the Amy Mann song was playing. And then right when it cuts to black, the song really kicks in and it's just so, so fucking perfectly well done. Well, I think he'd be extremely happy to hear that because he actually started with that image in his mind. And that from that moment is what the rest of that whole sprawling the whole movie is reverse in, reverse engineered to yeah, get to that moment. It totally came from just that. that that kind of turn. You know, that's that that, that kind of very subtle uh, emotional you know mm-hmm. resolution. You know, a sense yeah. of that small win that we have right as just broken, battered human beings. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's so perfectly timed too. It's like right when the lead guitar kicks in in uh, the song "Save Me," it cuts to black. And then, you know, written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. It's just, ah, it's so great. Well, let's start at the beginning, I guess, right? I mean, in terms of Paul uh, Paul Thomas Anderson as a guy, you know, San Fernando Valley, California kid, Hollywood. Yeah, grew up in the 70s, uh, came of age watching films. I guess his film education was, he was one of those guys, like uh, Tarantino. He grew up with, you know, checking out the video stores, and that's kind of how he learned what works and what doesn't, what he likes and what he doesn't like. Yeah, the connection that he had through his dad, right? So his dad's this guy named Ernie Anderson, who uh, was a late night kind of horror TV show host in Cleveland, Ohio, along with uh, Tim Conway, the comedian actor. Uh, and they eventually moved out from Cleveland to uh, to LA to set up shop where he becomes the voiceover guy, the guy who becomes the voice of ABC, you know, the yeah. love boat announcing all the shows and mm-hmm. everything. 
So he's already operating kind of in the shadow of Hollywood from the beginning and can see, I, I, I'm imagining, you know, he can kind of uh, see from his youth. Uh, he, he, I believe, you know, wrote a letter to himself at seven or to his teacher that said, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to, what was it actually? You probably remember better than me that uh, I'm going to write and I'm going to direct and I'm going to do everything. Awesome. I know how to do everything. Yeah. I yeah. Know. Yeah, <laughs> it just that that level of ego was kind of on display right from the beginning. Yeah, what seven, eight years old? Yeah, something, something like crazy. That. So yeah. you can it just that it, it's all about for me, you know. Okay, placing a guy like him in time and context, right? And you got you know your other sort of biggie guys that came out of the '90s, like Tarantino. Obviously, there really he PTA operates in the shadow of P, of, of Quentin Tarantino. It's great that they've been sort of friendly rivals, you know, throughout their career in terms of the competition, but there really was that 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 doorway that opened post pulp fiction right and reservoir dogs really in terms of that kind of genre film yeah. that uh that became the came became all the rage you know that sort of mid to late 90s sure neo noir revitalism thing yeah and they they very very low budgets on these things so it was very little risk involved for the studios so they just tried them all they just let everybody it seems like yeah you've got one of those scripts have at it film it here yeah um, but in going back to, um, to the whole California thing in terms of, uh, you know, just being exposed to Hollywood ag- acknowledging early on what he wanted to do, he was kind of on a single track mind. Uh, this is the only thing I know how to do. Right. Uh, it led to him making some short films and having access to early video cameras, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, culminated, I guess when he was, 17, making the Dirk Diggler story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, he goes on to kind of make the big 35 millimeter, you know, short film as film school. Uh, you know a little bit about that whole kind of period of his life, specifically around the film school stuff. I was curious, uh, like, he dropped out. Is that right? Yeah, he famously went to film school for about two days. And I believe, uh, I think you told me once that he turned in a David Mamet script just to see if uh, if the, the teacher noticed and he got like some shitty grade on it. And he was like, fuck this, I'm out. And he just uh, took the money that he was going to use for college and some gambling winnings. And I think he maxed out a girlfriend's credit cards and he made, is it cigarettes and coffee or coffee and cigarettes? I think it's cigarettes and coffee, Yeah, right? cigarettes, cigarettes and coffee. Coffee and cigarettes is the Jim Jarmusch movie not to be confused with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that was uh, sort of his film school. He was like, yeah, screw it. I'm just going to make a film and see what happens. Yeah, and he got like a whole Panavision kit. You know, he did he did it all up right. And he got Philip Baker Hall, right, to be a part of it. And then like Miguel Ferrer, who's kind of a known guy. I was, yeah, I was the, surprised the to see him. the cop that loses his ear in Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Well, that's the other guy. That's the guy oh, that, that— not him? Okay. Th- that's the guy who's in the uh, diner. But you're right. And that there is a Tarantino kind of reference, right? But, uh, but yeah, his ability to be able to kind of get those on the periphery— kind of actors speaks to his Hollywood connections in a way. Mm-hmm. He met Philip Baker Hall on the set of uh, a, a a movie done for PBS when he was PAing, right? Right. And uh, had the the brashness to try to get his short script in front of him, and the guy liked it. And, um, you know, from there, he was basically on to uh, creating his repertory, right? Yeah, yeah. But the, uh, the pre-Hard 8 stuff, really the only notable stuff I can think of, the Dirk Diggler story, uh, available on YouTube and uh, coffee and cigarettes. Or cigarettes and coffee. Yes, thank you. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, cigarettes and coffee. Both of those are on YouTube, and they're both worth looking at. But, um, you know, the seeds are there. They're the seeds of chance for me in cigarettes and coffee in a big way, where that $20 bill that sort of travels around. Yeah, and that's a theme that we're going to talk about a lot this season is is chance. There's a lot of a lot of themes that keep popping up in his in his work, and that's definitely one of them. But yeah, it was right there in Cigarettes and Coffee, the story of a $20 bill making its way around different people in this, in this diner. And then, then we will talk about making sense of the matter once the coffee is poured and the tip of the cigarette is lit and placed in the ashtray. Then we will address the matter. And from that... So he got into Sundance with this film, with this short film, and then uh, he was subsequently invited to join the Sundance Filmmakers Lab, where he was able to sort of workshop this longer version of Cigarettes and Coffee, where he takes the character of Philip Baker Hall as a sort of older, you know, mentor-like character, uh, and expand it into what eventually becomes Sydney in a way. Um, and yeah, it, the, it's the seeds of—it's funny— 
having kind of gone back to revisit Sydney, uh, thinking about the other influences that are apparent in it, right? So you've got the Philip Baker Hall component, but I think uh, the the movie by Jean Pierre Melville, the uh, uh, Bob Le Flambeur or Bob the Gambler, was a movie that I came across uh, that is about uh, which 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 he's actually said as much that it was a big influence, right? It sort of gave him the framework for what was this neo noir uh, movie that he made, where it centered around a character study of Philip Baker Hall's you know Sydney character, which <laughs> even uh, from another reference point comes from the uh, movie Midnight Run, right? Where Yeah, yeah, I remember you, you telling me about that. You went ahead and watched it all the way through. I think you were saying you hadn't seen it all the way through. I, at some I, point. I never finished it, but ultimately, uh, it, uh, Philip Baker haven't. Hall's character in it plays a guy named Sidney, and he's the attorney of Dennis Farina's character, who's the Las Vegas sort of, you know, um, uh, mob guy. Right. So it's like that movie came out in 87, so that's in the mix for him. Uh, you've got this old sort of you know hoity-toity art film thing uh, from the from the '60s that's circling around in his brain about a guy, an aging gambler who takes under his wing a, a, a young man and then a young prostitute, and it's a lot more sort of plot-driven and plot-heavy in that way than than ultimately Sydney is. It's just sort of a, a, a more, character study of yeah. its own right. But uh, but yeah, uh, it's it's funny to see those ingredients, those early ingredients uh, around Sydney. Yeah, all the um, all the hallmarks are pretty much in place, as a matter of fact. Uh, the stuff that we, we come to think of as Paul Thomas Anderson, the long winner, the, the use of music, and, of course, the, the stable of actors that he's known for working with. Uh, a couple of them are right there in, the first, uh, in this first movie. Yeah, the... Um like basically his whole team that got set up. I mean, he's a. This is what's funny about him to me is that he's obviously an extremely loyal guy, and he likes to work with the same people over and over again. And a lot of that early style that uh, continued to develop in the subsequent movies were all readily apparent with guys like Robert Ellswit, uh, who's a cinematographer who went on to shoot basically all of his other movies except for uh, The Master and most recently Phantom Thread. Uh, but it's on that movie too that he. Uh, developed the relationship with Dylan Tishner, who was the post-production supervisor on Hard Eight or Sydney, and subsequently became his editor, right? So there was a very clear Daniel Lupi uh, and uh, Joanne Sellers, his producers. Um, Goulardi became his film production right, company. Right, he named, named it after it. his dad's uh, yeah. character, his late-night character. Yeah. So all of those all of those ingredients kind of came together, not to mention, of course, to your point, you know, the John C. Riley connection and the Philip Baker Hall and Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's in the movie, uh, and then with uh, you know Samuel Jackson being yet another Tarantino connection, we have to say. I mean, yeah, yeah. He, he you know he he wanted him for Buck in in Boogie Nights. Really, he I wanted Sam that. Jackson for Buck. Yeah. Well, I, I, he turned I, it down. I look forward to when we talk about Boogie Nights because there's yeah. a lot of interesting actors to reimagine uh, in the context of that movie. To follow up on that point of the Tarantino connection and something that that I think is worth noting about it in terms of the first film of this, obviously, you know. Uh, very accomplished and arguably one of the most you know important 21st century filmmakers around. Blah blah blah. That uh, that in that late 90s of it being kind of that neo noir, straight to video is all over the place. He was able to easily get low amounts of money in order to go make his first film. They didn't know that he was going to go and make what he did. Or uh, arguably, I think they they uh, that, well, it's notorious that they had this whole awful experience around the making of it or the yeah. post-production side of it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that because. Yeah, I've heard some interviews with him. And when people bring that up, it seems like a very sore subject with him. With uh, Reicher Entertainment, they they chopped his movie up. They cut one of his long takes right in half. They just, they, they, they just, they fucked with the edit in ways that he did not care about. He seems like he's still a little upset about that. All right. You got a producer. Robert Johns, who is picking this guy up out of Sundance, right? He's like, love your short film and uh, want to make a movie. You know, they've been doing like TV stuff and he's now trying to get into the movie business, right? You've got all these like late 90s neo noirs, there's easy money in it, right? You got usual suspects, you got, of course, the Tarantino stuff going on and all of its sort of uh, derivative ilk things to do in Denver when you're dead or whatever. Yeah. So it's an easy, it's an easy entry. And poor old Paul got lulled into a situation where, oh, wait, I might be able to make the movie I want to make. I gave him the script. 
Yeah. And I'm going to shoot the script. And so he goes off to Reno, Nevada and shoots it. And then, you know, encounters hell in the edit room. Literally gets the movie taken away from him. Yeah. Yeah. They, they took his cut from him. And I believe the only way he got his cut was because he submitted it to Sundance, I believe it was. Uh, or can, actually. Can? Okay. Yeah, he got his cut in the can, and that can, he was able to convince them, all right, to release his version of the movie, but they had already butchered it so much that he had to reconstruct it, and he had to actually, he used his money, his director's fee from Boogie Nights, of which he had already gone on into getting the pre-production on, uh, and raised money from Gwyneth Paltrow, I think. Yeah, John I think C- Sam Jackson chipped in. Really? John C. Riley. Yeah. Yeah. So he like, went to his buddies. Of course, he always, always had this, this pack of actor buddies who were there to help him out. Uh, and then goes back to actually recut the film at, uh, at the negative level. And it's funny because you can actually see in Hard Eight, there are shots that have imperfections in them. Let's say technical imperfections uh, that are long takes, I think, to your point, around them having cut up a lot of these shots mm-hmm. that were intended to be oneers. Um, and, you know, okay, uh, what, Phil Baker Hall walking up to the uh, motel room uh, at that fateful moment where John C. Riley right. and Clementine are in their situation. He, When the camera actually lands at the door, it goes out of focus in a way that, while he's always open to imperfection in his movies, right, I feel like that is an example of the kind of you know workaround he had to do. Ultimately, I think the bad experience that he had with with the finishing of that movie and like really having to wrestle it out of the hands of these like straight to video kind of you know uh, low lifes scarred him hugely, and it's what catapulted him into the kind of enfant terrible of. Uh, Boogie Nights and Magnolia, right? Where right. I'm going to control everything. I'm going to actually open my next movie with the movie title in the shot in the first part of the movie. Right. <laughs> it's like after my movie has been ripped from me and retitled, uh, because, oh, well, you know why they actually didn't want to call the movie Sydney? Uh, no. It's no. Because they thought everybody was going to think that it was about Australia. Jesus. So it's like, these are the kind (laughs) of, you know, studio air quotes concerns that are going on at the time. Uh, So let's name it Hard Eight, which sounds like a porn. Yes, but I can make some arguments for Hard Eight actually working. So It does work as a title. I think it does work. The the whole thing with the Hard Eight and Philip uh, Seymour Hoffman scene, it works. Yeah, it does, but I mean, it's a, it's a it's a long shot bet, right? Yeah, and it's the it's the long shot bet that ultimately Philip Baker Hall takes on John C. Riley's character and on Clementine's character, and so there's a payoff. And he actually, I think, in that Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, uh, scene, takes a bet on him that completely. This is a great it's a great scene. It's one of Philip Seymour Hoffman's sort of like early shining moments of just really... Mm-hmm. Mostly improv also. Yeah. Just, Not really in the script. I, I, I skimmed over the script a few days ago, and yeah, that, most of that's not there. Okay, I'm going to light a cigarette now, old timer. See, the thing is, I like you, and I'm going to light a cigarette, and I'm going to let you have this time to place your bet before I finish lighting this cigarette. And then when I finish lighting, I'm just going to roll and fuck you. <laughs> You're laughing at that? I just said, fuck you to the man. Jesus Christ. <laughs> the way you look, I think you know what I'm saying, old timer. I think you do. Jesus Christ, why don't you have some fun? Fun, fun. <laughs> All right, shaka laka do. Shaka laka dooby dooby do. Shaka laka do. You got a little bit more there. Just coming in there, baby. Shaka laka do, baby. I'm almost lighting it, baby. I'm not allowed to cigarette, old timer. What are you gonna do? Two thousand dollar hard eight. Two thousand dollar hard eight's a bet. And then when he says, "I'm gonna place this bet," and uh, and Philip Baker Hall puts the money down, he actually, in my mind, and this is where I want to kind of get into some of the subtext for me of uh, of of Sydney or Hard Eight, is uh, he's showing belief in Philip Seymour Hoffman's character there. He's not yeah. falling. For the uh, you know, for the all the you know, sort of brush, brashness, and I'm a badass business. He's like, I actually think there's something in you here. I'm going to place a bet on you, and he does it super calm too. He, he's the exact opposite of Hoffman's character, and it disarms him. He mm-hmm. immediately starts getting all self conscious, 
and yeah. is like, wait a minute, now I'm intended to perform for this guy who's shown and faith an in me. there's an audience here, and they're all watching, and I love how that scene ends. With, I mean, he does not hit the heart eight, but uh, the camera just lingers on Hoffman's face, and he's still talking shit, but he, you can tell he feels like an asshole. Totally, yeah. I mean, he really took the took the wind out of the guy, you know, at the tables in a way, which just kind of speaks to the character uh, uh, of Sidney is just kind of having all this gravitas that can just suck all of the bullshit he's out cool, of man. any situation. It's totally Sydney's cool. Sidney's fucking cool. He's he's unflappable, almost. You only see him get his blood up a couple of times, and that's right when it looks like his secret's about to be exposed. I guess we should talk a little bit about what the movie's about. We're not going to go through it beat by beat. But we should kind of explain what it's about. We've mentioned neo noir, mid nineties, sixty um, something year old Sydney, uh, professional gambler. It looks like a very seasoned gambler. Mysterious past. We don't really know anything about him, and he's seemingly just very altruistic. And he takes in strays in a way. He he finds uh, this character John, played by John C. Riley, who he takes in, uh, teaches him a thing or two about uh, how to hustle at a casino to become a professional gambler, and uh, he sort of takes on like a, a, a surrogate father role with both him Which and with ding, Clementine. ding, ding, surrogate father roles yeah, in Paul Thomas Anderson movies. That's that's a theme we're going to come back to time and time again this season. So he takes him in. He, he, he takes in these two strays, this uh, cocktail waitress and a uh, just a sad sack, just a... A kind of a schlubby, you know, down on his luck guy. Yeah, yeah. Possibly even homeless at the beginning of the movie. We're not really sure, but he's extremely down on his luck, and he needs money to bury his mom. Well, if on that point of uh, the introduction of John and the schlubby thing, I actually want to throw in um, a uh, a theory that I have about uh, Paul Thomas Anderson movies that Heart Eight really kind of sets his table for uh, in the very first shot of the movie. All right. Okay. So in the very first shot of the movie, you have a sort of you know standard. Um, you know, uh, desert diner off the highway kind of thing. It's the same kind of thing that was in cigarettes and coffee, right? So that's yeah. kind of the starting point in which uh, you see uh, from across the parking lot, John C. Riley s- like sitting up against the wall beside the door. And in the first shot, an 18 wheeler kind of pulls through the frame. Yeah, it the covers way. the whole frame. It covers the whole mistaken. frame. Mm-hmm. And right after the uh, 18 wheeler exits frame, that's when Philip Baker Hall's character Sidney enters frame with his sort of long jacket, you know, very uh, dark and mysterious. We don't see his face. And the camera starts to track across the uh, parking lot and land on John C. Riley, and they begin with their, um, with their exchange. There's actually one other uh, instance of an 18 wheeler appearing in Sydney for me, and that's later at a very impactful moment when. Uh, Philip Baker Hall is on his way to the hotel room where John, or John C. Riley, right. and Clementine are in the um, in the, much hotel the climax room. of the movie. Well, pretty well, much it, close to it. It definitely is a big turning point in terms of uh, yeah. all right. They've got a hostage who uh, who's unwilling to pay Clementine, the prostitute, et cetera, et cetera. But what's important is, is as he's on his way, there's uh, the sound of hydraulic kind of air brakes, right? Truck mm-hmm. brakes that that Philip that Philip Baker Hall turns. To uh, acknowledge for a second, as he's on his way up to the hotel, the motel room, rather, I think that the appearances of eighteen wheelers in both Heart Eight and then subsequently in Punch Drunk Love, where we um, there's two instances of eighteen wheelers in that movie. One where Adam Sandler actually comes out of his office and sees the harmonium dropped off. This The taxi driver yeah. pulls up. Yeah, okay, I remember that. It's been a minute since I've seen that, but yeah. They drop the harmonium off, and then uh, he stands there, and he looks in this direction, looks east, west, north, whatever, and the camera's kind of cutting back and forth, and he's all alone, completely sort of uh, uh, soloed in the frame. And then in a jump cut, the uh, you cut back to an 18-wheeler just flying through the frame. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, <laughs> Yeah. And he picks up the harmonium and then he runs off, right? Right, okay, I And then that. the later one in Punch Drunk Love is after they've uh, exited the restaurant, after he's torn up the restaurant bathroom. Right. And he and Lena exit the uh, restaurant. There's an 18-wheeler that comes uh, around the corner as they're passing. As they're turning the corner, the 18-wheeler is following right behind them, and the trailer is moving very slowly. And as it passes them, it says, relocation at its finest, uh, you know, Hmm. For me, 18-wheelers in PTA movies 
are about big forces that can move through our lives that are unexpected but resonate. And in the case of Heart 8 here, at the very beginning, you have this 18-wheeler that passes through the frame completely in, you know, taking it all up. Right before and Sydney. Right meets. before Sydney makes that connection That's with That's interesting. And then, of course, again, with the, the hydraulics. And it blends in with the music. I think you were... Yeah, well, in Punch Drunk Love, it, br- it blends okay. in with the music. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a highly orchestrated thing, right. but, uh, but, but yeah. It's, it's at a very pivotal moment. Pretty much every time. That's interesting. I never noticed that. It's a, it's a, it's a little bit. I'm so, I'm stretching it a little bit in the second appearance of it with Heart Eight, but there's no doubt that uh, that for him, and at least in those two movies, he's using it as a device in which to indicate some sort of big force and big change. Oh, that's interesting. Anyway, with uh, with kind of sticking on the uh, Heart Eight point. Um, all right, so you have that kind of element within it, and you've got the surrogate father mentor thing that he applies to uh, to John C. Riley, uh, showing him the ropes in Reno. And how to turn, um, you know, small winnings into what's a, apparently bigger winnings in the eyes of the of the hotel, and that's actually mirrored later with uh, um, Gwyneth Paltrow's character Clementine when her and John are in the hotel room, and he's showing her how to get free cable out of the hotel right. <laughs> yeah. wall. Yeah, he's yeah. Yeah, so it's like there's this this interesting sort of like I'm going to show you the ropes kind of thing mm-hmm. uh, from both perspectives. He sort of takes on the the mentor, uh, puts on that mentor hat for a moment there. Yeah, interesting. But for me, ultimately, uh, Heart Eight is about a dad with two knucklehead kids. Yeah, a dad with a secret that he sure as shit doesn't want to get out. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, before I thought about doing spoilers for this because this movie's like 25 years old. But really, uh, if you're going to watch this movie. We'll we'll save something for you. Yeah, it, it it's it's a good turn. He's got a secret. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, um, the whole knucklehead kid thing just kind of is what sets up what we see so much. Uh, it's what we see set up later, or actually come to fruition later in his later movies of that continued surrogate family, and they're always being a father figure. This like older man, mm-hmm. right? And I think that 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 that's directly from his personal experience where. His dad, Ernie Anderson, was an older man in his life. I think, I mean, Paul Thomas Anderson is the youngest of nine kids. Jesus. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I think they come from a couple of different marriages, but uh, a lot of sisters. That ends up playing a role in Punch Drunk Love. Yeah, without a doubt. But uh, but in terms of these uh, older sort of father figures, you see them in the Dirk Diggler story where Robert Ridgely, who later played the colonel in Boogie Nights, Mm -hmm. He was a close friend of his dad's. Jack Horner. Yeah. He plays Jack Horner in that movie. Earl Partridge in Magnolia. Right. Uh, obviously, that is a kind of culmination of his father relationship. Oh, Jesus, there will be blood. I mean, it's just all through that movie. Yeah, but the early ones especially, uh, and it is, I think, him wrestling with those uh, with those early conceptions of, of, of these archetypes of masculinity and, uh, and, and father figures, right? Yeah. Um, and it's certainly apparent with Sydney, with Philip Baker Hall's character, um, and yeah, it, 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 it's it's one of those again interesting ingredients around his uh, upbringing and the things that he ultimately was wrestling with and uh, dealing with in his later movies. Yeah, John, um, uh, there's something I need to tell you. It's something you need to know. It's important. I need to tell you. I love you, John. I love you like you were my own son. Thank you, Sid. One of the other interesting things about Hard Eight that uh, that translates over into Boogie Nights and Magnolia. I'm not sure if you've heard of um, uh, Clementine's Loop. Yes, the music that shows up in two. Or three? It shows up in all three of all his three first of the movies. the ones we're talking about, okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it, it's sort of this like uh, tonal bell thing that opens Sydney. It opens the movie, mm-hmm. and then it reappears in the scene with um, Gwyneth Paltrow when she's just come to the uh, to Sydney's hotel room, and she's expecting some sort of sexual encounter, you know. She's expecting the older man to, you know, want to have sex with her, and she's kind of, you know— pulling at her clothes, and it's all very kind of vulnerable young girl feeling, you know, but it's this very foreboding kind of sound 
element. Yeah, right? it's full Sound of dread. Yeah, totally it, full of dread. Yeah, and it, it, it hits at the, the low point in uh, Boogie Nights. I don't remember where it is. It's in Magnolia. It is. Say? It's in the. Um, it's it's early in Magnolia when um, uh, during the Sydney Barrister uh, sort of montage of the kid who jumps off the. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And who as, gets shot on the way down during his suicide attempt. And yeah. it's the little boy who's talking to the cops, and it's a sort of cacophony of different you know, like, like Revolution Number no. Nine stuff, and that sa- that bed is right underneath there. So yeah, it's a total dread thing. And uh, again, one of those connections between these first three movies that I think is really so interesting about them as a standalone sort of set, this, this almost trilogy of a beginning of what is the birth of, yeah, a very important filmmaker who subsequently explores a whole new set of terrain differently in each of the subsequent movies, where you can kind of see in Heart 8 the... Um, the ingredients, as we said, of the type of uh, the style of photography, you know, the kind of the, the long shot steady cam, um, the lighting styles, the the early close ups, right? Those little cut in close ups. All of those things right. are being developed in Heart Eight. They completely flourish in Boogie Nights, of course, which is its own sort of animal to, to, to go into. But uh, and then kind of gets all the more extended and sprawling and competent arguably confident, certainly confident in the case of him as a filmmaker, confident in his execution or final product as a movie is with hindsight, it's a little bit questionable. But all of those things are just kind of like growing out in this like creative explosion. I mean, we have to remember that the guy was 25 when, or 24 and 25 when he made the movie we're talking about now, Heart Eight, mm-hmm. and then 26 and 27 when Boogie Nights comes out. And then 29 when Magnolia comes right, out. Right, before he even hits 30. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a, a tremendous amount of energy and uh, ego and, by all means, chops sure. at work in these yeah. movies. And it's what makes this one so interesting to go back to look, look at is because if you, are, if you are a PTA fan, if you like any of his other movies, in this movie contains so many of the seeds and uh, uh, other themes— so you think, what, that you can just walk through this life without being punished for it? In Heart Eight and Boogie Nights and Magnolia especially, you know, we start to see, as we already touched on, you know, the notion of chance, uh, this, uh, the surrogate family, uh, the uh, masculinity for me, I think, is a really big one in terms of uh, these movies and how he's trying to wrestle with not only his own masculinity, but the sort of popular culture uh, sense of masculinity, uh, past regrets, obviously, as we were talk- talking about in terms of the past, maybe, f- you know, you may be through with the past, but the past ain't through with you. Right. That, uh, that seed is in heart eight and ultimately culminates in a grand uh, sort of operatic view in Magnolia. Uh, self-reinvention for me is a big one. Um, both in terms of even somebody like John C. Riley's character yeah, in Part Eight. That was the first thing I thought of when you said that, without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, there's there, and, and somebody who's facilitating that change, right? Um, or some act of life or God or somebody else that is facilitating that. Yeah, change. an act of God certainly in in Magnolia. And then finally, the, I mean, the 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 sort of double thing of redemption and judgment. You know, he has a he has a clear sort of moral uh, sensibility. Yeah, there's usually some sort of comeuppance for people that uh, that that deserve it. Even if they're a protagonist, they usually the universe meets out its judgment upon them almost every time. Except not in Heart Eight. In the original script, yes, the the script ends with very much a downer of an ending that's not in the film. But it's just one of those things that you kind of needed when you write the movie. It's like, okay, well, here's this, and we'll tie it off here. But once you start making cuts and looking at what works it's nice to just and i'm sure he got more sophisticated he got more sophisticated about what the character study was and not necessarily he probably fell in love with the character like he does probably to a fault uh with a lot of his movies yeah but the note that the movie ends on is so sort of perfect and bittersweet it's great. Great and there's shot. a sense of of self responsibility that is a, a through line throughout the whole thing that really works but anyway i found this quote where uh is pta on morality uh quote 
Most people don't share my moral sense, which is I'll masturbate, but I have to clean it up very quickly afterwards. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> that was during the Boogie Nights era, wasn't it? I think so. I'll yeah, bet yeah. it was. He was a little brash about during his conversations and just really frank about being a 17-year-old horn dog. Just, yeah. Yeah, but 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 therein is like there's definitely got to be some comeuppance, right, of some kind, sure. even if it, and it's by degrees. And Sydney gets his comeuppance in a way, but uh, and we have yet to see exactly how it how it may actually go from there. But uh, anyway, that those things like that that whole self reinvention thing, Sydney himself, you know, has reinvented himself in later life successfully too. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, and it's it's funny the. Uh, the the world that we get a sense of that he was previously a part of was you know of old time mobsters and you know the underworld and throughout the movie we see that he's willing to take uh, you know extreme steps extreme <laughs> to steps cover it up. yeah because ultimately he has a sen- he has a need for control right it's like in later in life he's got this extreme set of uh, a very ru- uh, a very routine behaviors right mm-hmm. a very predictable routine. Playing yeah. within a world of gambling and chance, of course, that's the entire universe he exists in, and uh, between the sort of extreme behaviors of his bets on uh, big bets and hard eight craps, or his more uh, sort of safe bets in playing Keno, right? right? Sort of low-end stuff. Old man games. Old man yeah. games. Uh, he's just looking to kind of have a later in life quiet time. I'm going to find a couple of uh, young people to... Hopefully, you know, make up for some of my failures in life. Yeah, take them in. Uh, he explicitly says he's got uh, kids about the age of uh, Clementine and John, who he hasn't spoken to in years. Yeah, he's he's, yeah, he's looking estranged. for he's looking for redemption through that self reinvention. Right. Yeah, and he, he puts together a little family that he can take care of, and uh, he he certainly takes care of them until they fuck it all up. Yeah, goddamn <laughs> kids. Yeah, goddamn it, kids. It is totally about that. It's a bunch of knuckleheaded <laughs> kids. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I think uh, closing out in terms of Hard Eight, right? Uh, without give going into the whole third act, because the movie really kind of sets itself up in, in in thirds, where you know you've got the first part about John, you've got the first the second part about Clementine and their relationship, but that Samuel Jackson character really is what kind of comes in and throws the loop on all three of them. He's such a great villain. Yeah, he's, he's he, such a great villain. If you notice in Almost in most of his scenes, he's taking. He's a taker. Yeah. He's, he bump. I don't think he smokes a cigarette that he buys. He's constantly bumming cigarettes, I think drinks and stuff. He's, and uh, something else I won't get into, but it's, uh, he, he's a, he's a taker. Yeah. No, he's, 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 he's a con guy, but, uh, one of the, one of the later scenes with him, uh, that I love is he's wearing all, uh, leather. And the sound design in that is just great because it's just like all the creaking leather and it's like he's ominous and dangerous just in sound alone. Yeah. Um, that uh, that was really well done. I didn't even notice it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, there's surprises to be had in terms of the, the, the completion of Heart 8, but, um, but it being his first movie that set up the fact that, all right, the world is a dangerous place. The world of filmmaking is a dangerous place. I have to protect myself at every turn, ultimately resulted in him, you know, being, you know, going too far. You know, he oscillated too far to the right, subsequently, where he fought tooth and nail for everything, right? Right, yeah. And then he was vindicated in the success of Boogie Nights, but, uh, and, and ultimately gets final cut in Magnolia, but, uh, but it's all there in the experience of Heart 8, and uh, it's in Boogie Nights where, all right, that actually gets manifest in a way. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I think during the commentary in Boogie Nights, he talks about how he sat down with the producers and he just like read them the riot act. Like, it's going to be this way. This is going to be this way. And this th- right here, this scene, this is all going to be one shot. And there's no cutting this shit. And the guy was like, dude, you dial it down, man. Like, you're, you're, what happened with Reicher is very unusual. This is not, this is not normal business in Hollywood. So they had to get him to dial it back a little bit. Yeah. It was all in service of making great movies. Well, I guess that about wraps it up. For uh, Hard Eight Talk, uh, thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Um, are you currently watching anything? Have any recommendations related to PTA? Uh, the most recent thing that I've seen that has the most obvious marks of his work on it is uh, the HBO series Euphoria with uh, Zendaya. 
It's, yeah, yeah, I've seen I've seen the the trailer for that. Well, it it uh, it's been referred to by uh, a couple of folks as uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's "My So Called Life." <laughs> okay, uh, it's it's sure. it's a very visually rich and dynamic you know story of teenagedom and addiction. But uh, but there are scenes and sort of uh, you know sensibilities about it that are clearly uh, inspired by Paul Thomas Anderson, and it's fun now to see. You know, when we're talking about a movie that's, you know, 23, 24 years old uh, and then his subsequent films kind of playing out in our popular media now, you don't I've not seen a lot of it. Right. I mean, right. He's got he's got he himself was obviously clearly influenced by Martin Scorsese, yeah. Robert Altman, Jonathan Demme, all of these folks. Uh, but now you're seeing the, the the reverberations of his own interpretations of that. Yeah, uh, he's inspiring folks now in, in new media. So I highly recommend checking out Euphoria, especially episode five, the carnival episode, which is 100% Magnolia. Interesting. Okay. All right, man. Thanks cool. for being here. Yeah, thanks. And I uh, look forward to talking about Boogie Nights. All right. We'll see you then. So there it is, the first episode of Filmography Club. Clearly, I got the right guy for this first batch of PTA movies. Will's an articulate and bright guy, and he'll be my guest for the next two episodes. We're going to aim for a new episode every two weeks or so, which means that soon we'll sit down to talk about the second film in Paul Thomas Anderson's filmography, the much-celebrated Boogie Nights. I'd like to thank Michael Leeds, Will Fox, and Harrison Holmes. Filmography Club is brought to you by the good folks at We Own This Town Productions. Thanks for listening.